Okay, continuing on, we um, bouncing back between the, the two tours here. Uh, during my second tour, we were talking a minute ago about the Charlie models mushing through. And when I got into the Cobra transition, I, I was amazed at how much power the Cobra had, what a wonderful machine it was. However, in Vietnam, in the mountains, around Khe San, um, it wasn't much better than Charlie model was down in the Delta. And on a lot of occasions, we would only put on a half a load of fuel uh, so that we could carry a full load of ordnance, and uh, which would cut our flight time down considerably, but that's the only way we'd get off the ground. Well, while we were at Quezon, uh I was refueling one day, and I was jacking it up, and I was going to put about um, half a load of fuel on board. And I looked over, and here come a J model Cobra Navy. Came in there, a twin engine job. He came in there about 30 foot hover, did a pedal turn, and sat straight down on the pad. And I'm standing there watching this thing, and I was just mesmerized. Before I knew it, fuel was slopping out of the <laughs> out of the Cobra. So I thought, well, not a problem. Uh, our mission time tomorrow morning is probably around six o'clock, so I get up around five and go out and crank her up and burn it off. And we were parked on the logger pad, and there was about probably a hundred slicks and twenty or thirty cobras out there on the logger pad. So the next morning we get up, we go to the briefing, we're sitting in the briefing, and I uh, figured after the briefing I'll go out and crank her up and burn it off so that we can get that, that pig off the ground. And um, all of a sudden, whoop, start getting mortared, hitting. So within Oh, two minutes. There's one aircraft sitting on the logger pad. Mine. Because <laughs> I can't get it off the ground. So I'd pick it up to a hover and I'd scoot forward about 30 or 40 feet and then I'd hear kawoom behind me. I'd pick it up and go elsewhere. Boom! Where I'd just been sitting. I hopped all over that logger pad for about 10 minutes with them trying to track me with a mortar. And I kept yelling to my wingman who was up in, at altitude and said, take that damn thing out. And they would laugh and they were having a good up time. They said, we got bets on how long you're gonna make it before he gets you. And I finally, I said, enough is enough. And, and on one side of the logger pad is a real steep cliff. And I nosed it over the cliff and, and dove and just hoped that I would get translational in enough airspeed that I could fly. And we did, so we got out of there. And the ironic thing about it is, um, years later, I was sitting in the officer's club at Fort Bragg at the bar, and there's these two captains down at the end of the bar, and they were just yucking it up, and then one captain said, do you remember that day at Quezon where that stupid Cobra pilot was bouncing all over the logger pad <laughs> with mortars impacting behind him? And uh, they are just yucking it up, and I thought, damn, it's nice to be remembered. But now we'll flop back to my first turn um, in 68 with the 240th. I call this my rat story, and uh, as you can probably see by the image, I'm kind of a chow hound, you know, but back then I was pretty lean and mean, but I still like to eat. And the way we worked with the 9th Division is we would pick up a company of the 9th, the Slicks would, they'd land on a road when it come time for lunch, and we'd pull in the guns behind them, and we'd all sit down on the road and eat. And the the thing was if we took fire, sniper fire or mortar fire or something, all the slicks would crank and leave, the guns would take off and lay waste to wherever they thought the fire was coming from. And this was standard procedure in the Delta when working with the 9th. Well, we landed on the road and I'm sitting there eating my seeds and I look out across the rice paddies, about three rice paddies over, I see this banana tree. And hanging in the banana tree is this huge stock of bananas. And I thought, damn, I'm going to go get me some of those. So I went down and I went across the rice paddies. They were dry, fortunately, but I didn't want to rock on the rice paddy dikes because they booby trapped them. So I was walking across the rice paddy and I got over to the to the tree and I started shimmying up the tree and I grabbed a hold of this stalk of bananas and I started shaking them, trying to break it loose. And all of a sudden this humongous Viet Cong rat came out of the bananas and was sitting up there looking at me. And I thought, if he bites me, I'm going to have all these rabies shots to go through. Uh, and I mean, he was huge. He was the size of a small dog. So real carefully, I took out my 38, took close aim, and 
blam, one dead VC rat. Well, I was so proud of myself, but then I heard the whine of the engines. And I looked over and the slicks were already lifting off the ground. And the guns were cranking. And I thought, holy Christ, <laughs> they're going to roll in on this area in just a minute. So I ran as fast as I could across the rice paddy. Well, the guns had already taken off. My co-pilot had cranked and got off the ground. That was the standard procedure, get the aircraft up. And he came right back around and saw me on the, on the road. And he landed and I jumped in. And um, he says, uh, Commander wants to talk to you. So I got down there, yes sir, and he said, what the hell's going on down there? I said, I don't know sir, I went out in the rice paddy to go to the bathroom and some, some bitch shot at me. <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, we blew that whole, whole little bunch of banana trees away, but uh, that's my rat story. Never a dull moment in, in Southeast Asia, but... Uh, we had good times and we had our bad times, and I, th I think I portrayed uh, pretty much most of them. And uh, there are other things that went on, but I just can't recall them at this time.